Hey there, it is Tom Sir on behalf of Indie Structure Productions and this time we have a very special video series coming up and um, how should I put this? A challenge, so to speak. Now there's a variety of different kinds of videos online on YouTube where you can find people making guitars out of this, that and the other. Be it colored pencils or full on epoxy or something like that. I've noticed that there's one constant with all of these different videos and that is the fact that the body of the guitar is made of whatever. Meanwhile, the neck of the guitar is just a plain, good old fashioned guitar neck. More times than not, a maple neck with a rosewood fingerboard and, you know, probably bought ready. Now, there's something to that. I don't see that as being all that challenging. Yes, granted, there are different sorts of things that you have to keep in mind if you make your guitar body out of whatever because you can't really make it work the same way as building it as a solid body mahogany body or something like that that you're used to but if you throw in the little bit of a twist and make your neck out of the same material what do you get then so i propose to you a challenge to build an entire guitar made out of pine this is what we're going to be doing well we have our material, which is pine, which is not suited for this sort of thing at all. We need to have a consistent base to go from. So we're both going to be using exactly the same hardware, all the same tuners, all the same humbuckers, everything. For me, the most important thing is to make this function as a guitar. So that will mean using different techniques for different parts of the guitar. We'll get around to that when we get around to it. This is not gonna be easy. Hell no, this is gonna be really hard. This is probably gonna be the dumbest thing. Like I said, this is probably the dumbest thing that we've come up with, but boy, is it gonna be fun. It's gonna be, well, I say fun. It's gonna be fun after the whole process. It's gonna be a pain throughout. The main idea here is that we're not gonna go crazy. We kinda wanna make this as cheap as possible because if they don't function, if they don't work, then we just built a guitar for ridiculously, well, we just built a guitar for a lot of money that we can't even use. So, at the same time, this is kind of like a, make a guitar for ridiculously cheap and see how good it can turn out. So, hardware-wise, this guitar and this guitar, so the guitars each, Hardware-wise, costs 63 euros and 36 cents. That is cheap as hell. Now, thinking about how much pine usually costs, we're gonna add about maybe a hundred, not even. So, let's see. How good can a fully 100% pine guitar for under 100 euros possibly be? Let's find out. One of the very important things is wood selection and proper wood selection. So that's why I am at. Uh, what do you call it? Lumberyard, timber store? Timber store, there we go. So I'm gonna get me some wood. I'm gonna try and figure out what's the best they got for this. I think that for all intents and purposes, this will do. Another thing that I need to really be considerate of is the fact that there are quite a lot of knots. Preferably, I would not want to have the neck be quite so knotty. So, by the looks of it, there's a couple of places where I could make a neck. Probably there is a good piece, and then around the very front. So if I start with that measurement first, there would be better. And the body. <clears throat> Once again, I'm learning a little bit of extra. Say about there. And then I'll count the other one accordingly. All right. Make sure that I'm square even though that doesn't matter at all at this point. And uh, here we go. Up and planing. I said to save that little bit for uh, back plates and headstock veneers and stuff like that because this entire thing is going to be made out of pine. Everything. 
all the wood parts. It's going to be 8 mil. A little bit of excess, especially because I know this bandsaw, especially. Doesn't cut exactly straight. So what I'm doing now, I'm just using my finger as a guide. Give me a rough idea of where to cut. I'm going to have the square edge up against the fence, and that should, in theory, work. That's what about that. I think we're here. are basically my neckline. Fortunately though, I have four. I only need three. Uh, I'll be able to have four this time. Now.
the more I'm getting into this whole project, the more I'm realizing how stupid it all is. But hey, it can, it can still turn out to be something really good. You never know. But, I don't know, I'm, I'm not holding my breath, to be very honest with you. The thing is that I can't even apply too much pressure on this because the clamps will just dig in like hell. But it looks like that's gonna be all right. Not the best joint I've made, but then again, this isn't like gonna be the best guitar I've made. That's not the point. The point is, can I make a guitar out of this? All right, neck-wise, moving onwards. When it comes down to it, it's like the fretboard I'm not worried about, the body I'm not worried about is the neck because that takes so much tension from the strings and everything else that it has to endure, it's kind of a lot. Most people don't realize how much string tension actually affects the neck itself. There's a reason why there's a truss rod. I mean, this is gonna have a truss rod, but yeah, I'm blabbering at this point. Let's concentrate on glue. I'm moving way too slow. Yeah, this is a really dumb idea, but <laughs> it is what it is. Pine is also bad because it has a lot of um, sap. So if that sap gets in the glue joint, I'm screwed. That's why I decided to take the best parts that didn't have any branches or any knots or anything like that for the neck. I cut out a good bit of extras and uh, picked out the best pieces to do this out of. Now because my clamping calls are not long enough, I need to improvise. Yep. There we go. Granted I don't have the best possible clamps for this right now. It's overkill, but it will do. The bad thing is that because it's such a freaking soft material, I can't give it too much pressure because the clamp will leave marks that will be hard to get out. All right, so everything's been glued up and now we just need to straighten things out a bit. So I already noticed a little bit of a whoopsie with the body. It is about on one side, it's literally just like a centimeter. So maybe 10 mil off, a little bit too, too narrow, but no bother. We'll just put a block there and uh, fix that issue right up. So now, flat. Girls, you know the drill.
So the body itself, that's fairly straightforward because I already have a center line to follow, which is literally the joint. So I can just do that for the outline of the body. Now I can actually cut out that remainder from about here. Glue it onto, there, onto that part right there. Now, the neck on the other hand, that's gonna be a different matter. And first I need to find the center line. And of course it's not an accurate number. So 62, right there. Bear in mind, if you're doing this at home, <laughs> something similar at least, um, have a sharp pencil, not a pen, like me. Oh yeah, I'm seeing this, it's that way around because we're making it, it is gonna be a reverse headstock. Cause you know, I can do that. So that's my knot line right there, which gives me the point at which I need to have it angling back. Now usually you only need to do a couple of degrees I'm gonna go with three in this case. Uh, then it's gonna be about 13 mil thick headstock, so I'm gonna draw that at 15 to give me a line to cut to. Yep. And I can figure out the rest of the measurements from there. First things first, let's cut out. I want to get the headstock veneers uh, plain flat, but seeing as they're kind of small, they're not going to go through the thickness here. But that's nothing that a little super glue and masking tape can't fix. There we are. Much more secure.
have it. One headstock for now. I should do the same for the back plate as well. Okay, so let's trim this headstock down to size. Uh, first things first, remove this up just a hair. For routing, I want to take off as much of the excess as possible. I should have drawn on the size of the neck first, which now I need to do. Yeah, damn it. Get a little bit. Caliper real quick. <sighs> damn. <laughs> I want to have this be rough size of 20 mil at the nut line. My caliper is running out of batteries. That's the bad thing about digital calipers. Fortunately, I don't need it to be digital. And then around the 12 fret, I want to do 23. It's about there. There's going to be a volute. There. Now we can continue along and cut a little bit of a better cut. Move the camera over so you see what I'm doing. Alrighty, here we go. Let's try this again. Now, oh, ha ha. I don't have much of a leg to stand on. leave that flat because I want that to be a good cooling surface. Now, and stock shape. And this headstock shape is basically going to be refined on a bob and sander. So, chuck away the rest. Oop, missed. Uh, cut the fretboard a little bit more down the size. So, templates, super glue and masking tape trick. Once again, one of the easiest things to do. Now I prefer to apply the glue onto the actual piece that I'm working on. That way, if there's splurge or too much glue, it'll go onto the template instead of my work. Template supplied. Now ready for routing. The aim is to take very small passes at a time. Thank you. 
wary of thinking if things go wrong where will your fingers end up? I should doing a 25 and a half inch scale length so I am putting 25 and a half inches there which means bridge bridge position I can't talk today the bridge position is gonna be round around there Where do I want to have the pickup? That might not be a bad spot, to be honest. As for the neck pocket, that's going to be about there. It's really that far set in. It's going to be hard to reach those fronts. So I'm going to use the 16th but instead on the top scoop there, so moving it back that much. Be much better fret access, really. Now I have all my cavities set up, so it is time for me to kind of get rid of excess material. I'm gonna do that with the pill drill. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand.
I've already routed the back cavity. That went very well. So uh, I'm now going to move on to the front and do the pickup and neck pocket. I'm using the center of uh, the joint one as my center one. Basing everything around that. So it should be all looking good. I'm actually going to hit that template because if I don't, I'll be in a whole lot of trouble. That's not good. So, oh. I cocked up. That blows. I have to bring it to about there. Messed up a little bit. I went along with the old line, getting that I had made a new one. Mistakes happen. Maybe I'll do a little other way to access those higher frets. Now, the reason why I'm actually putting a radius on the fretboard already at this point is basically because I'll be pouring resin on top just to kind of stabilize the fretboard, hopefully to stabilize the fretboard. If I left it blank like this, poured the resin and then put the radius on it, I'm afraid that the edges would come through and then those wouldn't be covered in resin. Now, if I actually put in the radius beforehand, sand it to 320 or 400 or whatever I want to sand it to, and then put the resin on top, I'll have that layer to kind of protect the fretboard because it is very soft material and you want your fretboard to be, you know, hard enough for wear and tear. Now what I've done is I've silico siliconed off all the areas so that I won't have any overflow. I've already checked everything except for the pine fretboard. I've checked that there are no leaks with just water and everything is perfect and fine. Just a precaution though, uh, if there are any leaks, I don't want it leaking all over my balcony, so I have the fretboards in a tray. So if any leaks are going to happen, it's going to all just go in the tray. Now I am going to be using Polymere's Technology Chill Clear, and I've been waiting to use this stuff forever. And it's basically a two component resin, epoxy, uh, so I'm going to need two parts of the A and one part of the B. One of the things I need to be very wary of is getting the bottom and the sides scraping every last bit and I'm going along the bottom because I don't want to create bubbles even though this epoxy should react in a way where the bubbles kind of blow out by themselves. Here it goes. Let's try this out. Hopefully there are no leaks. Is that what the sound is? Now 
what I'm hoping is that it'll penetrate the wood at least a little bit to kind of stabilize it. It's going to add a little bit of thickness to the fretboard for sure on the fretboard side or the actual fret side. But I'm not worried about that because I can then plane down the back of it accordingly. I don't need a massive amount either for the pine guitar. And as long as I cover the entire length of it, should be fairly okay. I didn't need to hammer it in, but I wanted to get a pretty tight squeeze in there. Okay, cool. Let's get to masking off areas I don't want covered in glue. In this case, that's the steel part and the control part, the truss rod. Then on to the actual glue up process. I wish my bench was higher up, but it isn't. So we'll make do what we have. I have my clamping calls ready. A very important thing to do is to have everything ready before you do a glue up process. Now, if it was any more complex than this, I would also recommend doing a test, a dry run, but it is but a fretboard. Pretty sure I can manage. Done this, count done this countless times before. The dogs are playing in the background, so I excuse all the noise. Hey, you don't wanna have too much glue, but you also don't wanna have too little. So you don't wanna starve the joint, but you don't wanna flood it either, because that's not doing anybody any favors. What I usually do is I start on both ends and I loosely apply pressure just to kind of hold it in place. Okay, looks good. Looks good. Yeah, all well and good. So now just to clamp her up. Now if you have a good joint, you shouldn't need too much pressure, really, to get the job done. And yeah, like I said, I just have the two on the end at first to hold things in place. And then I move from the middle outwards. And that's just preference. There's no real reason for this, this is just the way that I'm used to doing things. And if it's not broke, why fix it? Tomorrow it's time to declamp and then take it to the workshop and trim it down. All right, that's everything for now. Great. It was very rude of me not, not to show the dogs that I was talking about. Well, there's one little bumpkin and there's the other little bumpkin there not helping me with all the work that I'm doing. This way especially. Alrighty, I know it's a bit loud, but we're gonna get this done. So, trimming up the fretboard. Should be fairly simple enough. I have a cutter with a bearing on it. And uh, that's gonna follow along to the shape. And always, from the movement. Nicely trimmed up, gonna do the rest by hand. 
sure I could go with a lower grit, but I don't want to take off all that much. I just want to get the radius back in there. And I'm not applying almost any pressure at all. I'm letting the sandpaper do all the work. And everything looks about right. And yes, it does. All along the neck. I do it it's usually scoring it first with a mask first scoring it with a scalpel blade like so and then taking a bit of a thicker blade to open those up a little bit more now the reason I do it like this is so that now I have better purchase for the saw easy way I've found a doing this is basically starting on both edges and then joining up in the middle. Now one thing I'm going to do straight away is clamp this neck down. Now you'll notice that I'm also following the radius of the fretboard because that will ensure that I had the same depth all the way through. And again, I just need to repeat this process 21 more times. All right, getting working on the volute. So what I usually tend to do when it comes to carving a neck in general, I'll do the final thickness of the neck on the first fret and the 12th fret. So I'm going to get started on doing that. Remember that Placing your volute is fairly important to keep in mind that your volute should be pretty much underneath the nut. Which is why in this case I'm moving it back a bit. Now what I usually would do is do the first fret and the 12th fret and then conjoin the two with a spoke shave. But now seeing as there's so much extra material to take away, I'm just gonna make my life a little bit easier by taking away some, uh, some with the spoke shave. Still got a plenty to go. One thing must be said, it smells great in here now. <laughs> Working with pine, that's one of the good things. One thing you really want to avoid doing is getting a dip in the middle. But, yeah, let's have a look. This chisel doesn't seem to be all that sharp. 
Because believe it or not, I still don't have anything to sharpen with. Before I left Crimson, I didn't have time to uh, sharpen all my tools. They were always sharp tools of hand. So, and in the couple of years that I've been back home, these have dulled out massively. Thank God this is pine. Moving on to fretting, and this is gonna be the loud part of doing things. Now I would have used a uh, another means of doing this. I would have used super glue, but I don't have any of that, so I'm just gonna do type on. Clean it up so it doesn't so it is just in the slot. And the way that I do frets is I tap in both ends and then I even it out from the middle. So that means the tangs are going in and to the side, which means they're not gonna pull straight out. Because if I was just to bang it on like that, they're just gonna go straight down and they might pop out. Let's do the next one. Keep this going up until we get all the frets in. Now you could cut these pieces of fret wire already into a good shape or the right size, but I found this way of doing things, I end up having a lot less waste because I'm not having to trim off the ends. And the reason why I'm using water and type bond is because Typon actually comes off with just water when it's wet. Yeah, water cleanup is what it says on the bottle. This is one of the easiest fret jobs I've had to do. It's <laughs> really easy. The frets are sinking in very quickly. Not surprising because it's very soft wood. I have to say that usually I don't glue in my frets, but because of the pine build and what it is, I feel like this is probably a good approach to have just to be on the safe side. I'm gonna trim down the edges and get those bevels in there. So first things first, using a leveling file, I'm not gonna talk over on top of this, using a leveling file just to get those flush. Next up, I'm using a fret and beveling tool. So it's basically just a file that goes on an edge. One of it rests one edge rests on the fretboard like so, and then the file is at an angle to get a bevel into your frets. This is also something that you can do with a leveling beam or a leveling file, but this is just the dedicated tool for the job. I might go ahead and just use this, or actually I might use this. Drilling in to the control cavity. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go like this. And that went very well. Just and just made it through. Got a little bit of rash there, but that's no matter because I haven't sanded this one yet. Well, not right around there, it's exactly there. And you might have been wondering why I was holding my finger so close. It was because I was using basically my finger to guide the drill bit or, or guiding the drill bit toward my finger and then moving it out of the way. So I actually have, you know, a reference point. As long as you remember to move your finger out of the way, you should be just fine. Then using a, what about spade bit? Is this called a spade bit? I can't remember. 
Now, I've never liked these bits before, and I still don't like them. So I already measured out the first part. Now, seeing as this isn't exactly a straight line, I can't <laughs> just mark out and connect the two. So instead, I'm gonna use my finger as a guide Let's see how close I got. Yep, that's pretty much close. All the way through. There we are. Now, it doesn't look all that great, I'll admit. Don't think these, I don't think that these drill bits are all that great. So, I'm gonna go backwards to start off the holes. Hopefully. That'll make my life a little easier, and I'm gonna go a bit slower. Not as graceful as I would have hoped. Yeah, this is just because I figured that it would look a little dull if it was just a flat back. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think while this does make it more comfortable, I do think it makes it also a little bit more interesting. I think that that is pretty damn good. And then it's only sanding left to go before we start gluing in the neck. Actually take the table down, smidge. Yeah, I think that's a hell of a lot better. Okay, so next up, we're gonna do something very fun and only slightly terrifying. Um, I've been looking forward to this part. We are actually going to burn everything. All right, so next up, we're gonna do the side dots. Now, to do that, first things first, I'm gonna need myself a pencil. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. 
because of the burn marks, I'm actually going to put them a little bit off center. So I'm going to have them, instead of being three and a half mil, I'm just going to go three mil from the top of the fretboard. So at least they'll be even from the edge of the fretboard. Don't need them to be too deep. There we are. Now, for a good while, I thought about what I wanted to do for inlays. A dark wood would have been very nice on the light fretboard, but I was only going to use pine when it comes to wood on this guitar. So I have some really, really burnt up some pine, and I am going to use that as my inlay material. I'm going to combine this with some super glue, and that will provide a sort of dust and glue compound sort of thing. It's very normal to actually use ebony dust for inlay kind of stuff uh, combined with super glue, so this isn't far off. <laughs> I'm going to do the rest and then we'll come back after I've sanded it down and we'll see how it looks. All right, so the side dots turned out pretty good. Uh, I'm going to sand this whole thing down still so they're, they're going to come out looking even better. I already forgot one very important step, which is to eliminate splooge. So some masking tape along each side of the neck pocket so that when there is splooge, I don't have to worry about excess glue all over the place. I can just wipe down or I can just remove the tape instead of having to do any extra work. I have a little glue spreader here. Make sure to get an even amount of glue all over the place. Not too much but definitely not too little either, because too little glue can be problematic. Also, too much glue can be problematic. So, everything in moderation. If at all possible, always avoid declamping. In this case, I just have don't have enough hands. of it everything went on pretty spot on all right so the neck is now glued in and we're gonna get to some sanding in preparation for some cherry red stain so basically I'm just gonna get rid of just the top layer of basically charcoal because that's gonna come off anyways and this should bring out the grain a little bit more. And I'm just using 320. It actually comes off very easy. Alright, so 
So I'm gonna get this cleaned up and mask the fretboard because I don't want that to get stained. And then I'll be right back. So I'm gonna be using some Crimson, Ga Crimson Guitars Stunning Saints Cherry Red on this. And I have a feeling it will look really freaking cool. layers on this so I'm not really applying it all too wet here but I don't want any excess moisture to go and warp this All right, now I have all the frets nicely polished up. So it's time to polish up that fretboard. Very handy to have a strip of tape going along the side of the fretboard. So when you pull that, all the rest of it just comes off very easy. And 
as it polishes, it should as well ensure a nice hard coat on the fretboard. Which, you know, considering it's fretboard, it's a pretty good thing to have. Now I see one of the things that always bugs me is I see so many people or so many luthiers on YouTube who use microfiber cloths to polish up guitars. Well, from my personal experience, I've only noticed that microfiber cloths and the fibers with in the cloth themselves actually scratch the surface and the finish of the guitar and I can't ever unsee those type of scratches from people's work that have used microfiber cloths so instead I opt for really soft cotton and that gets the job done very nicely. And once you start hearing this squeaking sound, you know you've got a nice polish. That sound. Of course, if you have access to a buffing wheel, that just makes your life so much easier. I don't, so I'm doing it by hand. But I also like doing this by hand. Call me crazy, but it's therapeutic in a way. All right, so next we need to figure out the bridge position. So it is probably gonna be somewhere around there. So our scale length is 25 and a half. Then we're gonna check with a straight edge along our fretboard. Like so. That's situated there. First things first, I'm gonna need a ground wire. Now due to some issues with the neck, having to use a small plate underneath the bridge, but that is no matter. Because it's long, as I have the ground wire making contact with the metal part of the bridge, I'll be just fine. One more check. Perfect. Now I've already test fitted the nut and it seems to be sitting very well. So now I'm using a half cut pencil that just sits on top of the frets. And this gives me a line onto where to cut the nut slots. So let's see if I actually need to do any work on this still. And by the looks of it, it's damn near perfect, but it is a horrible plasticky nut. So it has a lot of sharp edges. 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some sandpaper, just some 320, and I'm gonna get rid of all those sharp edges because you don't want any of those. You don't wanna overdo it. Come on. Okay, I finally got a drop out. So. Easing it in, making sure it's centered. Now being very careful on the fretboard side because I don't want to change my intonation point. Time to install the tuners. Fortunately, I've been smart and I have drilled out and marked out the holes for the screws beforehand. So it's now quite literally just a matter of placing everything. This is one of the things that irritates me a lot is when people forget to take off the plastic from the back of the machine heads. So I'm doing that already at this stage. It is so cool to finally see this come together. The black hardware was definitely a good choice. Ah, oh, clumsy me. Seriously, it's one of those days where nothing is staying in my hands. It is fairly annoying. I'm gonna push through the wire for the pickup, but I'm not gonna actually screw it in just yet because I like to leave at leave that as the very last thing because there is a little bit of wiggle room here. And seeing as it is rather far away from the bridge, I wanna get strings on first and then once the strings are on, align the pull pieces according to those strings. Pre-soldering wire actually makes things so much easier in the long run because you don't need to worry about solder not sticking or trying to get in general trying to get solder to stick onto your wires or any surfaces at all this makes that 10 times easier those are going to pop right off so that's all good now first and foremost Grounding point. Now what I usually like to do is not have wires, or it's a good method to not have every ground point in the same lump. So now that I have the bridge, bridge ground there, I'm not gonna ground everything else to that point as well. This isn't a necessary thing you have to do. I just find that it makes life easier when you're doing maintenance for if you need to figure out where there's an issue. If there is an issue, that is. <clears throat> Makes troubleshooting a hell of a lot easier and faster. We don't need to figure out, or don't need to unsolder the whole lot. I hmm. wonder which way I want to do this. So that it makes sense. Probably like so. So I'll do the output first. Now I always give a tug to every joint to see that they're good. This is definitely not the cleanest wiring job that I've done, but it does do the trick. <clears throat> I'm not gonna put the soldering iron away just yet because I need to test the electronics. That's not going anywhere, so I don't have to worry about that right now. This is where it gets really exciting because we're nearing the end. Um, I'm putting tens on this, 
while I could have very easily put nines on, I don't like nine gauge strings. They don't feel like anything. So instead, putting on tens for a little bit more added comfort. Hopefully this thing doesn't implode on me. <laughs> so I don't know if you saw that there, but uh, when I have a bridge like this, I usually bend the end of the string just a little bit, and this helps me get the string underneath and into the bridge. Or underneath the saddle and going through where I want it to. Instead of having to poke around for a little bit. Now bridge alignment wise, that seems to be my best bet. Didn't even need a pilot hole for that. It went in very nicely, actually. Moving on to the computer and checking through in this manner, whether there is any signal coming through. Okay. So there's nothing happening, which I'm gonna assume, yep. See, so the lead is good, but immediately when it goes into the jack, something goes wrong. So I'm gonna flip around my jack solder and we'll see if that fixes the issue. Okay, so it turns out that it was not that, it was just the pickup live wire um, had come loose. So that's why it didn't make a sound, but See, it's catching quite a bit here. So I do need to figure something out. Either raise the bridge up or raise the nut a little bit, but I'll figure something out because I can't do that. But so yeah, I'm gonna leave it to settle for the time being. And I'm gonna <laughs> screw in the jack plate and screw in the back plate. And then we'll see what it's like when I go ahead and intonate it in about a week or so. It is pretty much the start of the Christmas holidays now, so I am going to go and do Christmassy things. Then when I come back, it's time to intonate this and see how it holds up and see if there's anything that I need to do. All right, so now the guitar has had time to settle for a good while. See, I started filming this last week, so on the 31st of January, and this has been sitting over a month period by that time. But seeing as I ran out of time, I am now filming this on the 7th of February. So keen-eyed viewers will notice that the this video actually, well, the master edit comes out on the 9th. So on Sunday, this is Friday. So I, I am really cutting it close with this one. So anywho, I need a sip of coffee. Like so, and yeah, I am gonna be using the Neural DSP Nolly Archetype plugin and basically going through a couple of different sounds. I'm gonna do some, some clean tones and then some distorted tones and I'm already going to apologize for my playing because I am not a guitar player per se. I just like to build them. You have heard this many times if you've watched my videos. Acoustic sound of the guitar already is very resonant. It is very loud and that is very surprising to me. All right, so let's go through a couple of sounds, shall we? So picking through the Nolly library. All right, so first off, Straight off the bat, this is the DI. That's what the guitar sounds like on its own. No effects, nothing straight into the input. So basically I'm going from the guitar, cable straight into the 
M Audio Fast Track Pro into Logic and Neural DSP. So, first off, some clean tones. This is what it sounds like. question that somebody's bound to ask me, does it gent? No, you tell me. I need to bear in mind that I usually pick very hard and these are tens, so I really shouldn't be picking that hard. Metal rhythm. I'm not a lady player by any means whatsoever, but I'll give it a shot just for you guys and you can laugh at me later. This is the only lady thing that I really know, to be honest. <laughs> Sounds mean. All right, so let's see. What do I think? Well, I think it turned out very well, considering it is a pine guitar fully, and it works, and it sounds moderately good. I'm pretty sure it would sound a lot better on, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing, who knows how to play guitar. But um, I managed to get some sounds out of it for the most part. I'm thoroughly surprised at how this turned out. It was. Not as painful of a process that I thought it would have been. And sure, there's been complications here and there, but that happens. And you can't get around that sometimes. But um, I really hope that you have enjoyed this video. And thank you so much for watching it. I hope you have enjoyed it. Please hit like to, sub hit like to subscribe. See, I'm tired. I can't even make sense anymore. More coffee. What I meant to say was, thank you very much for watching. If you like what you see, hit the like button. The little bell notification will let you know when there's more videos coming out. And subscribe to see more because I have an entire series coming up on this, which will go a little bit more in depth than this video did. This was just a sort of master edit that had a lot of stuff cut out just, you know, to try and fit it all into however long this ended up being. And yeah, this was fun. I got to do more challenges sort of stuff soon.
If you have any ideas for future videos, put those down in the comments below. I can honestly say that I'm glad it's over because this has been a whole lot of work to make the guitar and to make the videos. It has been a lot of work and hopefully it's paid off. And I hope that you have enjoyed watching. So until next time, see you guys.